Welcome to the next episode of Debt Talks, a series by the Private Debt Initiative of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm Moritz Schillerich, I'm a fellow of INET, and we have a great panel today to discuss a question that, is, that makes the headlines almost every day. A trillion here, a trillion there, fiscal policy is back with a vengeance, austerity is out, it's so yesterday. Um, but we want to ask the question, how much is too much? How much space do we have uh, in terms of, uh, with regard to public debt? And we want to talk both about the short run, we, the short term. We want to discuss how fiscal policy has been a very powerful policy tool to stabilize the economy in the pandemic and to um, hopefully generate a V-shaped recovery. But we also want to look at the long term we want to ask the question, with interest rates low and the challenges so large, thinking about climate change and digitalization and other um, changes in the, in, the econo- in the economy, what role should government play and how much space do we have for public investment? And how do we make sure that the, government, that the public spending ends up in the places we want it to end up in? <laughs> to discuss this, we have three, I um, couldn't be happier to have three amazing panelists. Um, we have Claudia Sam. She is a senior fellow at the Jane Family Institute and a former Federal Reserve economist. Welcome, Claudia. Very happy to have you here. We also have Rudiger Bachmann, the Stepan Family College Professor of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. Rudy, thanks for joining us. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ludwig Straub, he's a professor of economics at Harvard University. And all of them together will discuss the question, uh, public debt, how much is too much? We'll start, as usual, with a short introduction by the panelists that um, give their opening statements. And at the end of our discussions, in the end, we will have a Q&A. I will weave in the questions uh, from, uh, from both our panelists and the audience into the debate. So please submit your questions anytime by clicking on the Q&A button. But now let's get started. Claudia, uh, the floor is yours. What are your thoughts on the situation here? Great. Thank you for having me today. And I will affirm that this is an absolutely important question for us to be grappling with. What we, the federal debt spending, how much is too much? What should we be doing with it? And it is also a very urgent and lively question, as we all know. Like this is very much in the policy debate. So where I want to start with my remarks is to underscore how much of a sea change we are undergoing in macroeconomic policy, or at least are poised to undergo. So I started at the Federal Reserve in the summer of 2007 on the staff's macro forecast. That was an absolute birth by fire as a macroeconomist in the real world. And what was the most difficult for me as someone who followed consumer spending and household finances was watching the recovery grind on. And in particular, once we got to 2012, 2013, the United States Congress not only shut off, tapered off the aid that was going to, say, the jobless or to families in general through tax cuts, they actually threw it in reverse and started to undergo a a period of austerity. And I know that was not limited to the United States, but obviously that was, as someone covering the U.S. economy, that was extremely apparent to me. And I could see in real time what that was doing to families. And so fast forward to COVID times, and I've had the privilege to work a lot with members of Congress, advising them on fiscal policy, was why I left the Fed. You're not allowed to do that as a Fed staffer. And I was so heartened. And I, I'm not sure everyone can appreciate this. The American Rescue Plan, so the large $2 trillion package that Congress enacted earlier this year after Joe Biden became president, that, that was learning the lessons from 2013. That was going big with deficit spending. Now, I was part of a very uh, robust debate in the United States among economists as to whether that was too much, if it was not the right time. Uh, I argued very forcefully that it was. I mean, backed up by data and research, and people can draw different inferences. I don't want to act like I have the crystal ball. But to me, that was so important because that was the lesson learned. Right. In 
in the crisis last March, everyone's a Keynesian in a, in a foxhole. It did not surprise me that a large package passed unanimously. It did not surprise me in December when the pandemic surged, that a trillion dollar package was passed, that two trillion in March of this year, that was to me the biggest sign we've had so far that there is a sea change. Now that passed, uh, in part, it's being cannibalized right now with some of the unemployment benefits being shut off early. But I do think it's important to move past that package because that was that's the macro stabilization package. That's likely the last one we will need. God willing, the pandemic gets under control. Uh, and now in the United States, there's a big debate about the what we're called the American Jobs and the American Families Plan. And a large part of this is infrastructure spending defined in many different ways. And then there's a piece that's really investment in families. I mean, we have a year of a child tax benefit that is essentially guaranteed income for kids. And that could potentially get uh, extended into the next, like say five years. So I'm not convinced we have a sea change until we see these next packages. Um, I am very much on the side of the number, how many trillions we spend, is not the important question. It's what we do with it. And I do find the debate about debt frustrating in that it gets very fixated on debt to GDP, debt service to GDP. And I think that's asking, I mean, it's a question we need to ask, but I don't think that should be the question. And so I have a lot to say about what we should do with that. I will say last summer, I had an opportunity to brief one of the um, uh, congressional committees and I came in with a PowerPoint. This was in the summer and I said, okay, five trillion. And I had like a trillion for automatic stabilizers, a trillion for more of the, like another round of chat, not a trillion, but I had all these pieces. And one of the uh, Congress members, you know, raised his hand on Zoom and was like, that's only four trillion. And I was like, oh, just the other trillion, whatever you want to do. Right. So um, and I don't want to be glib about it, but I think there's so much need to improve the long run growth pr prospects of the U.S. economy. And I think if you look around the world, there's a lot of opportunities as well. Um, but, you know, that's kind of where I stand on this. So I'll leave it there for now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, lots to talk about in just a second, but I want to hand over to Ludwig and ask Ludwig why this time is different, why this time we can spend more and why our budget constraints are maybe different. You just uh, put out a couple of months ago a fascinating paper with your co-authors. Uh, maybe you can weave that in and tell, tell us uh, if and if not, uh, if we should be worried or what, how much space there is for us. Great. Well, thank you very much, Moritz, for uh, bringing me on, and I will absolutely do that. I was thinking for my remarks, I would like to take a bit of a broader perspective, thinking of how we got where we are today and, and how that maybe informs what kind of fiscal policy we, we might need and what we can afford or, or not afford. Um, now, as you mentioned, this is all based on joint work I've done with my serial co-authors, Atif Mian and Amr Sufi, but I don't want to claim to speak for their uh, views, so this is all uh, my own, uh, my own views. So this narrative that we have worked out over, uh, uh, a few papers now, it basically goes as follows, you know, any economy is made out of senders on the one hand and savers on the other, you know, spenders buy the products, economy produces, savers save, and through that, they indirectly finance a uh, new investment. I and mean, we used to have some kind of balance between spenders and savers. And what was not too much spending or was not too little spending, not too much saving, not too little saving. But what we've seen more and more over the recent decades is that we have started to shift, see this balance shift more and more and more towards savers. And this happened through many different channels. Uh, we highlighted the increase in income inequality in the U.S. and other advanced economies. But you could also have other things that happen. For example, you know, uh, we have less progressive taxation now. Uh, we have increased saving uh, more globally due to population aging or due to uh, you know, reserve hoarding by East Asian central banks. So ultimately, this means in the, in, the, in the world economy, but in the U.S. also especially, there's more saving now than before and less demand by spenders. And to counteract that emerging imbalance, uh, central banks, of course, have stepped in and they have started lowering interest rates. 
But guess what? We all know now that interest rates are pretty much as low as they can be. And that's a problem because then we lose uh, uh, the monetary authority in terms of stabilizing uh, the economy very effectively. Uh, and there's obviously unconventional tools as well, but I'm not going to uh, speak to those. But there's definitely a severe limitation in that. And so this is where I see fiscal policy coming in. Um, and this is why fiscal policy now is a way more prominent and important tool uh, than, than, uh, than what it used to be. So how can it mitigate that situation? So I think it can do one of two things. It can either fix the imbalance that caused the, 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 the problem, or it can take advantage of it. Right. So fixing the imbalance can come in many forms. Uh, for example, it come, can come in the form of more progressive taxation, more redistribution. It can come in the form of leveling the playing field, creating greater equality of opportunity, uh, investing in schools, in underserved communities, and, uh, and a whole host of other uh, uh, um, uh, pro projects and programs, some of the, which Claudia just mentioned. Uh, and she has way more expertise on the specific plans that, that, that we can use uh, than I do. Um, now, taking advantage of it can come in the form of borrowing at low interest rates. Uh, and we can use that borrowed money to do all sorts of good things. Um, for example, invest in infrastructure, digitization, green technologies, et cetera. And so I think that then the question is, which of these two approaches do we want to take? And my personal opinion is that I think we probably want to take a combination of the two. Um, but let me point out that we probably can't go all the way at fixing the imbalance and at the same time take full advantage of it. Just because when we fix the imbalance, that will naturally already reduce the amount of saving that is done in the economy. And that will naturally bring interest rates back up, which, of course, reduces fiscal space, but it also increases monetary space. So it brings us back to a more you know, balanced economy, something that was maybe more uh, the case a few decades ago before we had these increases and, 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 and imbalances, uh, these increases in, in income inequality, for example. So this is where uh, I am right now in my thinking. Um, so I, it's a more nuanced perspective of the current levels of fiscal space, which are certainly ample right now because interest rates are very low. And I agree that there are many sort of worthy projects uh, to use it for. Um, at the same time, I think we also need to always uh, think about uh, the imbalance. And, uh, and, and I personally wouldn't want uh, you know, governments to, re to rely too much on the imbalance without thinking uh, about ways to actually attack the imbalance itself and you know, reduce inequality and get, get us back towards a, uh, a, a more balanced economy uh, going forward. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Ludwig. I'll pass over to, to Rudy, who has been um, uh, active, also very active in the, in the European debate um, about uh, fiscal space, uh, fiscal policy. Um, maybe with a question, Rudy, you have, take your um, answer, have, give, you have your time to, for your statement, but you had some ideas how we could make sure that maybe the borrowed money ends up in the right space. Places. So maybe if you could weave that in, that would be, I think, very helpful uh, to get the conversation going. But Rudy, the floor is yours, please. Thanks, Moritz. Uh, yeah, I thought I'm going to uh, bring in the, the German perspective, although I have lots to say to what Claudia and, and, and Ludwig said, but we can, I think, do that a bit later. Um, but that's why you, I guess, invited me. Um, so for the international audience, um, just a bit, a little bit of context. There is a, a federal election uh, coming up in Germany, which is uh, a bit unusual because it is a really the first election where uh, the, the 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 reigning chancellor is no longer basically uh, 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 you know is is no longer on the ballot. Okay, so this is a very very I think the first actually for Germany, uh, uh, and and so the sort of. Even the governing parties have to sort of come up with new candidates, perhaps new programs. And so one of the debates that's currently raging might be a little bit too much, but it's, it's, they're going on in the, in the policy sphere in Germany. And this will be watched at least, uh, at least in the European uh, context, but I imagine maybe even in Washington, is uh, what are we going to do with the firm, famous German debt break? So what is that? It's the, it's the constitutional rule uh, which uh, allows Germany only to have a, a debt a deficit to GDP ratio uh, in any given year of uh, 35 basis points. Okay, 
Um, this can be uh, in, uh, in cases of uh, great calamities uh, like the COVID recession. This can be waived as constitutional rule um, with a simple majority, which I, I recently learned. I thought it always thought it had to be a two third majority, but it's actually a simple majority. It can be waived. And so the question now is, um, how far is Germany going to go back to that sort of putting that rule back uh, back into place? Eventually, they have to, unless they change the constitution, which I would say there's zero hope for political uh, majority to do that, because to change the constitution, you actually need two thirds, uh, a two third majority. So the question is now, how fast are we going to go away from this sort of state, de little bit state dependent regime that they built into this? Uh, into this fiscal rule, into this so-called debt break. That's a, a, a big debate. Um, so the left in Germany would like to ideally get rid of it. That's, I mean, that's sort of the ideal bliss point scenario for them. They pretty much know it won't, it, it won't be possible. Um, and uh, the conservatives would like to go back to it uh, as fast as possible, if not next year, then certainly in, in 2023. Um, at the very latest. Um, and so, so that's the debate. Um, and uh, so the left is trying to come up now with the sort of, you know, things, sort of measures or ideas how to soften that blow. The idea that a, a bunch of things discussed is, you know, sort of try to keep, try to convince the, if, if not abolish the rule, which again, I don't think is politically feasible or conceivable at this point, but let's keep the, the state dependent, except the COVID regime, if you wish, for a few years longer. Uh, if that's not possible, try create extra budget uh, financing uh, vehicles. Okay, that's uh, that, that, I, I, that, that's legally possible. I mean, uh, well, it's a legal gray zone. It's a constitutional gray zone. Gray zone but that's what sort of uh, pragmatists and insiders in Berlin are talking about now. Um, and third, uh, a third measure is sort of add another rule in the constitution or bringing back the so-called golden rule uh, that allows you to, to increase your debt space uh, whenever it is a, a government investment. So I see basically all of these uh, ideas come with problems, uh, especially the extra budget uh, vehicles there so that that's great it's created a lot of politi political and constitutional uncertainty because uh, any any person, any representative from a conservative party basically can go to the constitutional court and, uh, you know, as they say, in front of the court, you're in the hand of God, basically. So who knows what, how that's going to be and whether the constitutional court might then declare uh, individual budget unconstitutional, which, you know, for the, for the federal budget, I don't know that you want to have that. So that's I, I'm skeptical about that. OK, um, I'm also skeptical about uh, sort of a golden rule um, in the sense because it's it's just very hard to define what a government investment is. And in a sense, you know, it's I mean, even if you can find a pragmatist uh, uh, definition, just taking what the, you know, various statistical agencies use it for, you know, it's it's not clear that this is what you want for. Right. I mean, leftists will make the argument that, you know, social spending is an investment in in societal peace and societal uh, co cohesion, and why not? I, just, uh, I, I don't think there's anything prima facie wrong with that argument. So it's a very it's a very dicey operation. And so on the other hand, I also think that the that the debt break uh, is a bit stupid. It's economically stupid because it's not state dependent. It has a little bit of a state dependence in a, a building, which I just mentioned, namely the state dependence that when there's economic or other calamities like COVID, you can basically wave it for some time. Um, but that's about it. And uh, sort of, so I would prefer, so I, I think, and, and, and Rubik mentioned to this, I think economists would prefer a, a debt rule, if anything, to the extent that you want a debt rule for political economy reasons, and I think there are good reasons why you might want to have a debt rule, um, is to, to make it more market dependent, to make it dependent on things like the nominal growth rate, the nominal interest rates, et cetera. So because it's market prices that signal, that signal in some sense the opportunity costs of, of public funds, and that's all not in the current debt break. And the economists would like to move into that direction. But then again, that is, sounds like a very complicated rule, and it's questionable that whether you want to write such a rule in the Constitution. And therefore, I have come up, and maybe this is a crazy, not very thought-out idea, but I've suggested what other economists have suggested previously, so this is not at all original, 
But I basically said, well, we have solved such a problem before, right? Where we have uh, problems of time inconsistency when we give it to the to sort of the you know short-term representatives, um, and we we let uh, we let other uh, you know we hand that over to with a very limited mandate to a technocratic institution, namely the problem of monetary policy. That's exactly what we do there, right? We we do not trust uh, the parliaments to keep our price level or uh, stable, and so we hand it over to the to an independent technocratic institution with that very limited mandate. And I would argue broad, broadly, the Western world has been very successful with that model. And I think we have a similar, structurally similar problem there. And so my suggestion was to think about, you know, given that we can't write uh, uh, an explicit market-based rule into the constitution, how much the government should go into debt um, or into uh, the, the deficit, the flow uh, value of it, why not have a similar debt commission that basically um, adjust the debt break uh, as sort of mar- in, in, in a market-based way with the things that a, a monetary policy would also do with a bit of a forward guidance, you know, sort of what they think the, the deficit will be in the coming years. And then the rest uh, stays with parliament in terms of, you know, how much they want to tax, how much they want to spend on what they spend, what kind of taxes. That stays all with the sovereign or the representatives of the sovereign. But we have this independent commission that, you know, that basically would would take over the, what we currently have in the constitution. I thought this might be a centrist compromise in some sense because we are not going to get rid of entirely. And, and there's no, again, there's no political majority, two thirds majority in Germany to get rid of the, to get rid of the debt break altogether. And so this was an idea of sort of marginally improve. Um, uh, marginally improved the situation in Germany to make it a bit more market-based, a bit more rational. Of course, my leftist friends in Germany hate that idea too because they think it's it's undemocratic and it's, again, too technocratic. And, and, and I, I'm sympathetic to that argument, but I'm thinking about sort of how can we get a marginal improvement to the current situation? I'll leave it at that. Maybe it's a crazy idea. I don't know. Thanks, Rudy. Claudia, what do you make of this? You know, Rudy ran us through all these uh, ins and outs of the constitutional rules, debt breaks, um, special purpose vehicles. Don't Americans care what the money gets spent on? Right. And I guess just to follow up on Rudy's point, because I do think this idea of finding ways to at least align some of the fiscal policy programs, like the size and the timing of them to market conditions, as he said, I think this is an area that economists in conjunction with policymakers and policy experts should keep exploring. So I did quite a bit of work even before COVID on the idea of automatic stabilizers. Now in Europe and particularly Germany, like your safety net isn't full of holes like the United States, right? So there are many more stabilizers in recessions that kick on, particularly through employers to keep employees on payroll that we don't have in the US. Um, But the principle being that you kick out extra aid, extra relief through Congress in recessions. And so to I had a particular proposal with stimulus checks, like get, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars out to people as soon as we think we're in a recession. And this was, I mean, there's a regularity in that as unemployment starts to rise, even just a little bit, at least this, this is extremely um, reliable in the United States. I haven't done all of the rest of the world, um, but we're in a recession, like we're in the early months. And so that was part of my proposal to kick off stimulus checks in conversations. And there's legislation drafted for various new stabilizers. Um, you know, you kind of want something to rule them all. So like we do extra jobless benefits. And then those same proposals have a way to taper them off as unemployment gets back towards the recession. So there's a lot of programs you could put to that. I do... Um, To Rudy's point, like, okay, so technocrats, like at central banks, hate the idea of monetary rules, right? Because like, oh, we want discretion, right? So the idea that you're going to be like, oh, but Congress, we're going to take yours, like this is not uh, not going to pass. But I think the way that I have talked about these is that they could be more of guardrails, right? Like you could have certain programs or like Rudy said, this could kind of kick on, we're going to relax those constraints that we'd normally have, but then you governing fiscal body will have to think about, well, what do we do with that? You know, and so I I think there are some things in the United States because our safety net is so lacking that one should kick on as guardrails, but every crisis has its own 
flavor um, and its own kind of causing device. Recessions have a lot of similarities, but there always is something uh, that the fiscal policymakers could react to. Um, one other thing that I wanted to react to uh, in Ludwig's conversation is it's so important that we get the fiscal policy working, right? I think for far too long, we leaned on central banks to stabilize the economy. And in the past, that was a problem because we know some choices by central bankers say to be extremely vigilant about, un about inflation meant that we never, at least in the United States, got back to a full employment economy and income generates wealth. And there are millions and millions of Americans that just don't see that dynamic. And so wealth inequality has risen dramatically in decades. And then now that we're in a low interest rate environment, interest rates falling for decades, the Federal Reserve, central banks in general, have much more limited tools because like, they push around interest rates, whether it's through like explicitly through a Fed's fund rate or buying a bunch of securities, right? That's the action. And frankly, you know, if you weren't buying something before COVID, it was not about interest rates were too high. So they have limited ability to stabilize. Like they can't send money out until we change the Federal Reserve Act, right? Like they can't send money out. And then in the current environment, some of their tools, the asset-backed purchases, there's research, it's not definitive, but that suggests that actually could be exacerbating some of these wealth inequalities. So I think, you know, just to go back to your point, this wasn't entirely your question, um, but like the fiscal, like we really got to figure out the fiscal because without it, we are not going to solve the inequalities. We're not going to get like really robust recoveries, but I don't think we've figured this out either as an academic research community or politicians messaging this to people. Cause for so long, like the debt clock in the United States has been um, predominant in these discussions. So. Wonderful, Claudia. Ludwig, um, let me, um, this is, this is perfect because I wanted to, to bring the discussion towards uh, something that Claudia said at the very beginning, I mean, you call this call it a sea change in macro policy. Fiscal policy is back, um, and I wanted to hear from all of you: Is this are we at a uh, is this the dawn of a new era? That maybe the last era started with Milton Friedman's presidential address in, in 1968, uh, where the idea was that now we don't do stabilization with fiscal policy. It's messy. It's political. It's distributional. It's too late and not pointly, not not targeted enough. And so we went from monetary policy, but now we, to some degree, there are issues. Number one is that interest rates are very low, but also. Um, Claudia mentioned distributional concerns, effectiveness concerns. So, is fiscal policy going to be more of a, um, you know, more of a, or maybe even the dominant or the, the a much more important tool uh, going forward? And I want to take one little twist because we have a very active Q and A, and people are asking, um, especially also about um, interest rates being low. And um, Ludwig, for you, can we be sure that this is actually not the central bank? So maybe if you can weave it in, is the savings flood not real or is it a, is this is the central banks having an effect on um, getting interest rates so low? So maybe you can get the sort of twist these two into into one answer if you can. And then Rudy, feel free to track. Um, yeah, Ludwig, please. Great, great. So a lot, a lot to respond to. Um, so... Um, the way I would put it is, in some sense, I hope it's not the dawn of a new era because I hope we actually manage to fix some of the problems that got us here in the first place. And, and you know, with a more equitable growth, right, pulling us in a direction where, you know, maybe interest rates naturally going to rise because wealth is not so concentrated and savings is not so concentrated. Um, but I do fear that maybe the train has left the station and maybe we're not as you know, as bold and, and, and getting and fixing some of these problems. And, and in that point, I totally agree with everything that's being said that in that case, it is a bit of a dawn of a new era. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you know, in some sense, secular stagnation on steroids where interest rates are low for a long time. Um, I don't think it's the central bank's fault that they're low because the way I view the central bank, we have a 
former Fed economist here, so uh, I, 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 I'll let Claudia speak for herself on that. But um, but I view the central bank as as really, you know, they have a mandate and they try to hit that mandate. And if there's a lot of saving and less spending going on, in some sense, they're forced to reduce uh, and cut their interest rates and keep them low. So in some sense, it's a symptom of these underlying imbalances. Um, now, I agree with uh, what Claudia said that, you know, monetary policy was never, you know, perfect to begin with. It does have distribution consequences. And and I agree with you, even, even conventional monetary policy, you know, it does create jobs that maybe that uh, um, help more of those uh, at the, say, bottom half of the wealth distribution, but it certainly also revalues assets uh, that are predominantly held in the you know upper echelons of the wealth distribution. Um, and uh, and and you know maybe in the new era monetary policy is not going to be so prominent anymore. And maybe we are going to steer towards and I've thought about things like uh, you know this kind of a debt commission type ideas as well. Um, I, I, I agree with Claudia it's probably hard to get there because for all sorts of constitutional reasons. Um, but, you know, it does have some advantages. Uh, and, and I think those advantages are, of course, on the cyclical side, you know, thinking about automatic stabilizers, we're fully aligned with, with, with both of you. Um, but it also has advantages for investment, right? And I think, uh, I think that's, that's going to be really important to see whether in Germany, where I, uh, uh, I'm not an expert uh, on German economic policy, but uh, what, from what I hear is that there's a large investment gap uh, and that somehow needs to be closed. My parents still don't have super high speed internet. Um, so, so if, you know, if that, that investment gap needs to be closed and we can't use debt to finance that, that'd be pretty, pretty big limitation, I think of, of, of economic policy. So I, so I do hope they somehow find a way, maybe through Rudy's uh, idea, maybe, maybe, maybe through another idea. Rudy, over to you. And, uh, we, I'm going to weave in another question from the audience to have this um, as, as, as interactive as we can, namely, how do we, why is it not, why can't the privates, I mean, what, if you subscribe to Ludwig's analysis of the savings club pushing interest rates low and the government, the pu public sector, um, having the, can pick up the tab and, and, and use these savings and do useful things with them, why wouldn't the private sector step in? Well, I mean... Okay, let, let me go to that first and then I'll try to kind of <laughs> iterate backwards. So, I mean, because if, if, what, if the description of what Ludwig, for example, said about the German economy is true, then, you know, uh, uh, what, what's missing, uh, uh, yeah, what a, a lot of it is missing is classical public investment, right? So there's just certain things that um, that is going to be difficult for the private sector to do, right? Like high-speed building, high-speed uh, uh, in internet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that would be one thing. I mean, the sort of, that seems to be where the, where the dearth of investment is, although you could argue it's also, and, that, that, and I'll get back to that, uh, that we have uh, a low uh, a, a, a private investment in recent years. It's not, it's not that that is uh, sort of through the roof or anything, but I, I'll, I'll actually get back to that. So the first thing I want to say, I want to, I want to totally agree with Ludwig on, on this idea, this almost, uh, almost a conspiracy theory out there that, you know, it's the central banks that because of the expansion and monetary policy, that's, they screw up the interest rates and, and that's why we are there. Um, I think it's pretty clear what their mandate is. And, um, and if if central bank hadn't done what they what they done, had done, they would have not. Um, and we can debate how well they achieved their price level inflation targets, but I think they would have missed much much more. And I think that's I think any, any economic theory I know uh, basically uh, confirms that. So I think this is a bit of a frankly almost a horseshoe almost a horseshoe conspiracy theory both from the left and the right that it's the evil central bankers that do all this stuff. So I think the the underlying causes are real. I, I question a little bit, or the question is, so Ludwig um, uh, emphasized a lot uh, one reason, namely inequality, okay? And I'm not denying that. And I think there are other reasons why, even if, say, even if inequality has nothing to do with interest rates, it's something we should, we should be worried about uh, for social cohesion reasons, for moral reasons, frankly. So that, that's all fine. I'm all, all, all for fixing inequality. But I think the jury is out, and I'm, I'm, I myself don't have such a clear view 
the jury is still out what sort of the main driver is. Is it inequality? Is it there's aging, right? And aging, for example, the government is... So here the question is when he says, let's fix it, the question is, quantitatively, are the under underlying causes even fixable by the government? Aging? Nah, I don't know. Population policy is uh, mostly hasn't worked, I think, in, re in, in, in recent years, at least on the upside. Yeah, you can do China. You can you can kind of suppress fertility, but I don't know that you can. And even China is aging now, so or China is aging a lot. So anyway, that's not clear that the government uh, uh, can fix, should fix. Um, the other thing is that people cite a lot is is concentration, different sort of different production functions, right? Where where sort of non physical capital is it has become more important than a network effects and sort of where we have sort of more natural monopolies. It's sure that the government can think harder about antitrust policy, but what if that is technological? Maybe that's not so easy, right? So again, it's not so clear that this is something the government can so easily fix. So, so in that sense, it's, I'm, I guess I'm a bit less optimistic about the, the situation that the, government, that the governments really can, uh, can fix all the underlying causes, even if it could fix a little bit the inequality problem which again, I'm all I'm all for fixing. Um, and then what was the? I think there was one more question which I, I forgot. Um, um, you talked about central banks. I, causing... I mean, maybe yeah, maybe a little bit more general about sort of the return of fiscal policy as oh, a major yeah, right, stabilization. Exactly. So I, I'm not going to go on the record of saying there's a new dawn for anything because I'm surely you're going to be wrong about this, right? I mean. I, <laughs> I have the and I, I love Olivier. Don't get me wrong, but I, I have his uh, I have his speech at the AA right before the crisis in mind, where he said uh, the state of macro is good, and you know you're in this uh, ironic situation. Everything is peaceful, and you know, and and boom, <laughs> something hit hit us big time, right? So I'm, I'm not I'm I'm not going to go to into new dawn. I'm also Claudia mentioned this. But people, especially in Germany, is my especially on the left in Europe and in Germany. That's that's where I follow the debate the most. Is kind of keep forgetting. They keep forgetting that Biden is in a sense a president with an extremely shaky parliamentary majority. In in fact, he basically doesn't have one. Okay, and so as far as budget is concerned, everything in the United States is just like any other country. I mean, any, any other democratic country, you have to go to Congress. And, you know, how much of, of, of these Biden dreams, these Biden is actually going to go through Congress is completely up in the air. I mean, we, we had the jitters in the last two days that they had a, they had a compromise on a relatively modest infrastructure proposal. Right. And so they had a bipartisan compromise. Then Biden gaffed a little bit. Then all of a sudden it was uh, up in the air. Now it seems to be back on track, but we still don't know whether they have the 10 uh, Republican senators. What is munching on board? And, and, and even more so with the stuff that they, on top of that, want to do alone in the fall uh, through re reconciliation. It's completely up in the air whether we're going to get that. And until that is all done, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to call out a, a, a new era. I mean, normatively, I guess you can, could say that it is, and, and there I'm in agreement with, with both Ludwig and Claudia, that it probably should potentially, if we, if we can't do the fixing, it probably should be a bit of a new era, but I'm less confident in the capabilities on the functionality of the political system, certainly in the United States. Um, We'll see about Europe, uh, but that's, let's leave that for another day. Claudia, can I ask you, there's an argument in Europe that mm -hmm. goes as follows. Um, fiscal policy has been very powerful in the pandemic, and we have seen what it can do, and large deficit spending actually works as a stabilization tool and maybe even work better than uh, what we did uh, after the global financial crisis. And maybe, maybe we were too careful, but it is the austerity after the global financial crisis that put us in a situation to do all this fiscal stabilization policy now. So that was a necessary thing because otherwise we would have run out of fiscal space. What do you make of this argument? Yeah, it's fascinating. I First of all, I would never in a million years have come to this as the conclusion of the recovery. I mean, 
actually not just in the United States. I mean, Europe almost pulled us into a double dip by their uh, mishandling, in my opinion, and the austerity that happened in the 2012-2013. That was pretty scary. Um, but I guess... Well, it, it's but I, I I ran into this argument at a different panel. A very senior German economist, a former official, was the lesson from the Great Recession was you need fiscal space going into the next recession. I was like, wow. Um, but you know, we need to engage these arguments. And the thing is, with one of the beauties of macro is we are never going to have the definitive proof as to we only get to live in one world. Right. We don't get to live in the world where we didn't do the austerity or we spent more like it's just it's tricky to draw conclusions. I will say there was a fairly robust debate about deficit spending that has been really put to the side, I think, broadly speaking. And that was the there's a magical debt to GDP ratio that after which we're going to start seeing all kinds of problems in the economy uh, that was, you know, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff were two that were very um, prominent with this. And frankly, like we're well past those thresholds. And we saw some cases in Europe, particularly in Portugal, Italy, where that became such a driver of some of the even more severe austerity programs there. And frankly, that caused a lot more harm and hurt than it did good. And I mean, I was on a podcast with Ken Rogoff, like, and this was pre, um, this was more of last year, but he's like, we should be spending, right? Like he wasn't saying, oh, we're above 0.8 and now like all, all bets are off. And so I think our think our, our thinking has evolved uh, in terms of some magical number and that higher can be okay if the situation warrants it. There's still a very robust debate about when that, when we should be bringing that debt back down relative to the size of the economy. And I guess I'd just say, looking at the Great Recession in the United States, that was a very long recovery. It was a very painful recovery. And it was clear in the moment, and especially afterwards, when we had such a long expansion and unemployment got down to three and a half percent, it was pretty clear that more government spending, especially effective spending, earlier, much earlier in the reset in the recovery, could have got us back to a good place a lot faster. And there's so much evidence that the long-term unemployed, their careers have permanent hits. Productivity looked like crap by the time we got through the Great Recession. So I think there's real trade-offs in terms of prosperity and growth. But I hear the concern, like there, um, there are always trade-offs, right? Like for economists, there's no, there's no free lunch, and the concerns that came about so. Um, frankly, vociferously, uh, with the American Rescue Plan and the debates about, well, how much inflation can we handle? Um, Olivia and I have had a robust debate about the quality of the official potential output estimates, right? Like we started pushing into territory that is very uncharted. And I think this is where now we do need to like really figure out, can we do this? And this fiscal space argument is a little bit of a sideshow at the point. Like we're still trying to get out of this one, let alone preparing for the next one. Um, so I have a hard time with that argument, but it needs to be engaged because it is out there and it is, um, it's it's running around in Germany and I'm given the political, the campaign, like this is gonna be um, something that needs to be engaged with very thoughtfully. Um, the last little plug I would put in on my my sea change uh, comment, actually two little plugs. One is we absolutely in the United States are seeing a fundamental shift in the way monetary policy is done. Like moving to this average inflation targeting framework, which sounds like the most minor of imaginable changes um, relative to just inflation target. This is a big deal. Like if the Fed sees this through, you move from using forecasts of inflation, like we're getting close to 2%, which was absolutely the mantra in the recovery from the Great Recession. And, and they have fundamentally elevated the full employment mandate to be on par with the inflation mandate. And this is causing a lot of 
turmoil. Like this is a big change. Like there, there's a very strong academic community. Even some people who wanted three to 4% inflation targets are not happy with the Fed and their current stance. And like it's, it's really new. And it also puts fiscal and monetary policy rowing in the same direction. I do not think Janet Yellen or Jay Powell will do anything to put the independence of the Fed at jeopardy. But those two institutions have not been pushing in the same direction before. So there are risks there. And the last thing is change is messy. And uh, one of my biggest concerns, and some may think I'm a contributor to this problem, uh, is that there we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And there's a lot of infighting about former consensus, new distributional models, more aggressive fiscal pot, like what's monetary, how are private markets handling this? And then we do have some very different ideas like modern monetary theory and proponents of basic income. And it's it's getting to be a crowded tent. And I'm a little worried that it's going to be last man or woman standing instead of what we need is picking the best of all of it and synthesizing it. But like, that's really not how we roll. Um, so I think that's for a successful shift, we have to have more of a collaborative space. So great. Rudy wants to come in. Rudy, while you answer, I, I'm going to ask you, should the ECB, do we need an employment mandate for the ECB? Following up on Claudia, but jump in. Go ahead, okay, that's a, that's a difficult question. I'm going to sidestep now. Maybe come back later. So, um, by the way, just again, let's see whether the Fed is really going to see this through with the average inflation targeting. So, um, again, I'm always uh, skeptical about these these dawns of new eras. But anyway, um, I will say I'm, I'm completely with Claudia on Europe being a story post financial crisis. That was harmful. I think that's pretty. There's a, probably a consensus. There's also a consensus that uh, the austerity or the the non they didn't do enough uh, in the Obama administration, partly because they couldn't. Okay, because because of Congress of, of an obstructionist Congress. I think most economists would probably say that we didn't do enough. Um, I also am not too worried about Europe, right, uh, where things are very different. Um, I also obviously was totally in favor of the of the March 2000 or April 2020 uh, CARES Act. I will say though on the um, on the on the Biden on the Biden plan on the Biden rescue package, I part ways a little bit with Claudia, and I I, I think I'm more in, I'm I'm increasingly sympathetic to Larry's and and Olivia's arguments, simply because we now see. Um, at least some of the predicted uh, negative effects of it. I think we see them now. I mean, uh, we have, people are talking about a labor shortage. I think it's real. Anyone who just walks around anywhere with open eyes sees that there is, there is a, a certain labor shortage. We can debate exactly, you know, how much the quantitative effects of the increased unemployment insurance uh, was, how much the effect of the of the of the checks was and again I'm I, I like checks in principle it's a good I mean uh, Ludwig has models which show us that this is in principle a good idea in theory and all of that so there's a lot going on for it but you know we I think there's convincing evidence that it's not just childcare lack of childcare which some on the left said is all it's all just lack of childcare that's why people don't go back to the workforce there's a there's a substantive amount of retirement we see uh, if you look at the I, I have been told at least people. Have looked at that, and I do think that we see an increase in reservation wages, right? And that uh, any model will tell us if that's the case, we will have uh, a higher level of non-employment. Okay, and so people individually, completely rational, and maybe in the long run, it's a good thing that you know people take more time to search better for better jobs and stuff like that. But you know, we have uh, anyone. I, I don't buy the argument that we do not also have currently a bit of a supply issue in the United States, pr probably caused, and maybe, the, the, you know, if you look at it together, this is just the price we have to pay uh, on the other side, but I, I'm not willing to completely um, um, deny these, uh, the, these pieces of evidence. So I'm a little bit, at least as far, again, Europe, I think Europe should go be bold, more bold. And the other thing in the United States is something we haven't said, we have not 
if I mean, to the extent that we believe and maybe Claudia doesn't believe it, but to the extent that we believe the CBO debt and budget forecasts, um, and this is an argument that John Cochran has made in this debate, if you believe if you believe these forecasts, and again, we can debate whether we believe them, and the implicit interest rate forecasts that are in them as well, they're not they're not innocuous, but it's not about R smaller than G, right? It's about primary deficits, massive primary deficits, okay, for years to come in the United States, okay? And so R is smaller than G simply means that you can, uh, depending on other, or depending on how big the difference is, you can afford yourself a little bit of a permanent primary deficit, but it doesn't mean that you have an infinite <laughs> primary deficit at your disposal or, you know, a, a, a very large one. And that is something Ricardo Rich has made this argument, John Cochran. And for the United States, I think that is just true because we don't, again, politically, I don't see where we have things like the debt in Germany, the debt break is there. So, well, that, that will take care of it if we don't change it. I think it does too much of taking care of it. But in the United States, we don't have anything like that. And so if the CBO is right, then the R smaller than G debate is completely pointless. I agree. Uh, I'm with John Cochran and Ricardo Rich on, on that point. Anyway, so I think I'm a bit more in the middle here than, uh, than Claudia. But it's always easy to say that you're in the middle. Okay, and then ECP, um, dual mandate. I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm. I haven't thought that through, so I'm going to punt on that. Ludwig, you jump in, and Claudia has some time to collect the arguments. Um, yeah, but please, Ludwig. Perfect. Um, so this is a super interesting discussion. Um, let me just give one perspective, um, and this is based on some recent work that we, we've done. Um, so. I think the underlying discussion between the two of you is uh, is basically a question of whether you know increasing fiscal uh, 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 or using fiscal space today is a substitute for using fiscal space in the future, right? So do I need to run austerity today if I want to have more fiscal space in the future? And what we have found in our analysis is that it does not have to be a substitute. Um, but that requires relatively low levels of government debt. And I would argue that especially Germany was probably in a situation after the Great Recession where it could have done more and without you know, adverse effects on fiscal space during the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Now, that's probably not true for all European or our Eurozone countries, right? For some countries that were sort of teetering at the end of, uh, at, at, at the verge of default. And so I imagine if, you know, whatever, Italy had said, well, we're going to go big with a 10% whatever primary deficit in 2011 you know, or 2012, that would have probably not gone over well with, with interest rates, with markets. So it, I think it's a case-by-case -case decision. And um, for the U.S., um, in, you know, I think it remains to be seen. Um, our analysis suggests that we're probably um, uh, more on the side where there is some substitutability, precisely because of the, 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 the region, uh, reasons uh, Rudy mentioned that the structural deficit that's expected uh, for the US is already relatively high. Um, no, that doesn't mean unaffordability, right? That doesn't mean we're going to crash and we're going to default. It just means that there's some substitutability here that uh, we, we should uh, I think about. Um, perfect. But Ludwig, you haven't given us the magical number now. What is the magic? <laughs> I, you know, that's all. I'm going to stick with Rudy here. Uh, you can look at the paper, and there's going to be a range of numbers. Um, um, I don't want to, you know, go on on the record uh, now and putting out a number that's certainly going to be wrong. Um, so, so I think no, we I think definitely do have ways Claudia to go that. before we default, right? Um, I mean, I, mean, I don't think we're right. anywhere near an imminent default. Claudia is right. There is no magical number. I think that is really, if you want to be a serious economist. You do not want to hang your head on a, on a on a magical number. I think that's that's obvious. Yeah, I think the challenge is those economists or policy experts that advise Congress, like you got to write a number down, right? So it is a lot of fun when I read academic papers trying to you know figure out. And when we don't, when the experts don't take a stand, the inference is going to be drawn by people that may or may not understand your models. So just a warning. Um, but, you know, setting that aside, I think a couple points, one on the Fed, uh, if you talk to market people, one of their mantras is don't bet against the Fed. 
right? So the Fed is going to see this through, right? Because they spent years, like there was an introspection that was kicked off under Janet Yellen's leadership that was, we did this wrong. Like if you asked Yellen, lift off in 2015 was a mistake, right? And they really worked through what are the tools? They brought in academics, they did listening sessions, they talked to real people. The Fed is usually frightened of real people. Um, And again and again, they were getting, particularly from the community groups, jobs, 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 like, you know, that this functioning of the labor market and getting that full employment mandate to be at least on par, Jay Powell really took that to heart, right? Like this is, I mean, so the Fed spent a long time thinking about this and they're going to see this through, right? So the effect, I mean, but if inflation, you know, like they're going to adjust, right? They're not like they, you know, they're, we're data driven, like that's a real thing. But this, again, this shift from like, we have to see the conditions from we're forecasting them, that's huge, right? Um, so the Fed is gonna like, they're for real, right? On this one, um, there's still gonna be a lot of battle and discussion. And we've already seen that. These reserve bank presidents, they're very colorful. They do not have the votes, right? So just, you know, just kind of, they're entertaining, but that's about it. Um, And we need dissent. I don't want to be dismissive of that uh, because we need to debate these things. Um, I, actually, there were a few more things I wanted to say. I just, goodness, I I really want to make that point about the Fed. Oh, oh, I know what it is. So this, okay, two more. One, the CBO, the official estimates of potential output, which have been very important and like like how much space do we have before there's crowding out? And then like, it was all pointless, the money. I, on the encouragement of a, uh, another economist, I looked in the technical appendices of the Congressional Budget Office um, potential output. They assume that 2015 was full employment in the United States. And in those assumptions, the black unemployment rate of 10% is considered as best we can do. Right. And that is not like they just have an update. I mean, CBO has got a lot of things going on. Right. But even if you brought it to like the four percent national unemployment that we saw in like 2018, 2019, that is a huge revision to potential output. Like that's huge. So I think we have to really like look at our tools. I mean, Art Oaken in the 1960s created potential output, right? Like it could use a refresh um, or at least a discussion. So there's that. And then the last thing is. I want so much for G to be higher, right? That growth rate. And I think that's where I wish fiscal policy would do the most. Like macro stabilization has been like a huge thing, whether it's monetary or fiscal, it's like, gosh, dang it, we need that growth. And so that's why I said in the very beginning, like how much is too much is really the wrong conversation. I really, in my opinion, I want us to see how do we get growth up? How do we get productivity up? How do we get an economy functioning? Like, I don't know all the answers, but I know if we don't do that, like, all the rest of this is kind of beside the point. Thank you, Claudia. Um, We have to, unfortunately, look at the time. We are almost up with the hour. We have two more minutes remaining. Um, I'm going to give you all a very quick um, uh, chance to give your thoughts about Things that have come up, uh, two points that have come up in the in the Q and A. One is, but what if rates go up again? And B, what about inflation? Please shoot. Uh, maybe Ludwig, Rudy, Claudia. Uh, we have two minutes. Please. <laughs> um, so I don't see the structural changes that are supposedly might have happened during COVID that would push rates on a persistent level up. I mean, maybe Larry's right and we are going to see the shift in inflation expectations. I guess the jury's still out. I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit more on the side of Claudia here that I think the structural things like, you know, inequality, aging, et cetera, they're all with us. So I don't think that's going to go away. Um, but certainly, you know, inflation expectations, we still need to see what happens and whether that increase in inflation that we see now translates into those. That's why I'm I don't think rates themselves are going to uh, are going to go up very dramatically. But again, you know, economists are wrong all the time. This is my current, what I would currently uh, think, but, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to be convinced uh, otherwise. Okay, Rudy, inflation. I mean, for, as far as interest rates is concerned, um, well, I mean, the, 
First of all, I agree with Ludwig. I don't think that the structural um, the structural factors are there. But if you're worried about, it, I mean, there is an easy way to test the markers, right? Uh, increase the, the your debt maturity structure. I mean, uh, this is no one says that you need to have. Uh, I don't know where we are currently, seven, eight years in the United States, or even lower. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a low number anyway. It's not. Right? Why? Why not go more with thirty year? Why not? Why not do consoles, uh, etc.? I mean, there's there's so many so many debt debt uh, instruments that you could use and to test the market. Really, the market will tell you how you, how they feel about your debt uh, uh, after these operations. So I think that that can be managed. Um, inflation, yeah, I think a lot of. Um, the, the, indeed, a lot of the inflation we currently see that is indeed something that is uh, more or less a smokescreen. Um, I don't necessarily see that as 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 a harbinger yet of of, of of persistent inflation. Certainly, I don't fear it for Europe yet. I don't see any indication in the United States. The jury's out. I mean, we, we will see. I mean, that that is, I think, policy dependent. If if I mean, the more Biden does, and for good reasons, you know, and and. The more this will, whatever Biden does, will actually also have supply side effects. That's what ultimately Claudia is talking about, right? If I don't know if we do, uh, if we do what we what a plan for the families say, and that would massively increase the the labor supply of women further, of mothers further. Boom! All of a sudden, you have a you have a bigger pie, yeah? and, and inflation is not is, so. I mean, so that, that that will depend. I guess the last thing I want to say to Claudia is that we, we all like G, we all like big G, and then the question is, <laughs> where do we believe it's coming from? And there are still some of us who believe it's coming indeed from the supply side uh, and not just from the government uh, trying to engineering these things in the long run, not in, not necessarily uh, cyclically. Yeah. So I'll give my 30, 30 second words. view. Yeah. One, policy makers have done nothing yet that will reverse structural trends and problems in the U.S. economy, at least. They could. They, they may be doing it like with the infrastructure, with these other investments, which I agree with Rudy, are just like pushing the private sector. They're not going to carry us home. But we haven't even seen it start yet in that sense. And the other one on inflation, I've given hundreds of hours of interviews on inflation. Lovely topic. In, in just one sentence, we are in the 2020s, not in the 1970s, right? So I think we got, we've got we got to get moving to these infrastructure investment discussions. And inflation, like Rudy said, I think that's a cost we had to pay to get this recovery on hyperdrive. So that's my two cents. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks to our presenters. This hour passed by so quickly. Uh, but yeah. we have to conclude the Zionet Debt Talk conversation. Thank you so much to the speakers and the audience for joining us today. To view past episodes of the Debt Talk series, please click on Watch All Episodes to the right of this video or visit our, the website at ineteconomics.org. Please follow INET Live at INET Economics to hear about new episodes and information on upcoming events. Uh, see you next time and uh, have a great summer, everyone. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.